wings raised up. The first time they knocked, Mavis didn't hear them. She was in the back room where Philbert stored his things. She numbly pulled out his old army hat and folded it inside the thick green uniform, along with his Hopi moccasins and a half-finished casino doll. She laid them all out again on the spare bureau. She picked up an old box and tried fitting everything in. But the casino doll wouldn't, didn't want to go next to the army stuff, and the moccasins wouldn't stay underneath. Soon the box was empty again. The next time they knocked, Mavis was walking to the kitchen on the other side of the house. She stopped in the shadows of the hall that led to the front door. The two heads on the other side of the screen merged and leaned in. Mrs. Yestua, a woman called. You home? It was a Bahana voice, each word coming out as clear and hard as a stone. Mavis made herself as small as she could. The last thing she wanted was white people coming around. Philbert had been dead half a day. When Mavis woke up that morning, she looked over and saw her husband lying there on his side, away from her, one knee bent. He seemed fine the night before, smiling quietly at her, as always, before falling off to sleep. The hand resting on his side this morning seemed fine, too, relaxed. But there was something wrong with his fingers. They were too still. She slid her wrist. She slid her wrist along the dark skin of Philbert's back. It wasn't warm or cold, but cool. Bert, she said, stop playing. When he didn't move, she lifted up the old blue quilt. Nothing lurked, disturbed, or upset. Cut it out, she said, leaning her small body over his. Up close, his black hair shone and smelled of the stuff he used to slick it back. His eyes were open, but barely. She touched his knee, hoping he'd stir. He didn't. When she leaned further, she saw a thin line of blood running from the corner of his mouth to where his face pressed against the pillow. What she could see of his cheek was stained a dull red. She lay there a while beside his body, thinking of nothing. Finally, she made herself get up. She pulled the sheet around Philbert's body and closed the bedroom door. The next thing she knew, she was in the storeroom, moving his stuff around. We've come about the arrangements for Philbert, a different Bahana voice said from behind the screen. Mavis had figured, after she phoned So'o, that the news would make its way pretty through the village pretty fast. Her grandmother knew everyone in the Hopi way, and was related to at least half of them. But Mavis never thought word would reach the church on the other side of the highway this quick. She told So'o that she wanted to be left alone for a while, but here they were, already wanting his body. Philbert had only recently gone the Jesus way. In the 70s, he retired from the army and started drinking. He'd been, a bit, he'd been on a binge when they, he and Mavis met nine years ago in the empty pocket saloon in Holbrook. Lost, as grandmother So'o used to say, clicking her tongue against the backs of her teeth. But Mavis had liked the man she had met. She didn't care that he was old. She wasn't so young herself. She liked the way he, his, he fluttered one hand above his head when he talked, like a crow settling peaceably down, or a butterfly trying its wings after the rain. She liked the way his eyes looked slightly off to the left, instead of burning their way into, his, into her skin the way other men's did, making her smile, making her do things that had nothing to do with love. Philbert never made her do anything. Mavis had been the one who had wanted to get married. Sometime last year, July or, July or August maybe, Philbert had started going to church, the Hopi Mission Church at the bottom of Third Mesa, where the sandstone glowed orange red. The church that had been destroyed by lightning and slowly rebuilt. Philbert never said anything about going, never told her that she should go too. He just disappeared some Sunday mornings and came back around noon. He liked to take off, 
for a couple of hours here and there, and Mavis never bothered about it. He had had a whole life before her and needed time by himself, she figured. It was her cousin Clifford who'd said something. You'll never guess whose greasy black head I saw coming out of church, May. When Mavis shrugged, Clifford's lips curled into a frown. Your husband's, Filbert. Clifford hated seeing any Hopi go to church. But for a long while now, Filbert had been going to the plaza, too, to see the Katsinum dance. Watch the spirit beings fill the center of the village. Long hair, black ogre, center man. He sat there all day listening to their slow songs of clouds and wind and corn and rain. Filbert had never taken a sa Filbert had even taken a sack of blue cornmeal to the Katsinum resting place where they ate mid-afternoon. And the last Katsina doll he had carved, Warrior Maiden, had been real good. She looked truly fierce, crouching down there with her thick bow. The Bahana who bought it kept asking for others. Filbert had been carving more now that his health had been bad, now that they both stopped drinking and they had time on their hands. Lots of Sundays after church, he was down at the wash, gathering cottonwood for more Katsina dolls. Mavis sucked in her breath now and let it out slow, worried the Bahana ears could hear even she and Filbert had never talked about death, burial, what they wanted and didn't. It had never seemed right. She had always just assumed her husband would be buried the Hopi way, his knees folded towards his head, his thin body wrapped in a blanket and placed without a word between the rocks and the cliffs. In the quiet, Mavis listened to, the, to sand blow against the glass of the window, a fly buzz along the screen. There came the caw of a crow. The white women started talking in low voices, whispering words she couldn't hear. She felt her, she felt her throat get smaller, her heart squeezing inside the wall of her chest. A white sheet of paper slid under the door and flew across the concrete floor until it hit the sandstone wall. Mavis looked at it. Please let Filbert's soul awaken in heaven. Mavis stared at the blue letters until they fuzzed. The note said other things, how Filbert had promised himself to Jesus and how the church would pay. But Mavis's eyes came back again and again to the word soul. She heard that word every morning the five years she'd gone to the mission school that both she and Il Filbert had attended, though a decade apart. The teachers were always saying they should pray for their souls. Mavis wondered whose souls they meant. Hers? Theirs? Someone else's? And what exactly was a soul? She imagined a bean-shaped thing, the color of fog slipping around in her body, hiding under her stomach, crawling among the bones of her back, something that wouldn't stay put. When Mavis asked So'o, she just laughed and said Bahamas thought only one thing was worth saving, people's souls, theirs mostly. So'o had said, sometimes ours. Bahamas didn't know yet that everything has a spirit, rocks, bugs, rain, everything.